Rockefeller's partner, Maurice Clark, did not share his enthusiasm for the oil industry. The partners reluctantly decided to part ways. The two agreed to bid against each other for the firm's assets, including the refinery. The stakes were high for both men, but Rockefeller's resolve was unwavering. That was the day that determined my career. I felt the bigness of it, but I was as calm as I am talking to you now, John Rockefeller. In the end, Clark bid $72,000. Rockefeller bid $72,500. It was a $500 difference that altered the course of history. Immediately upon taking control of the company, Rockefeller focused his energies exclusively on oil. As the Civil War ended and America's economy became more and more industrialized, demand for kerosene grew in the nation's rapidly expanding urban areas. Rockefeller's profits soared. In 1866 alone, sales of Rockefeller kerosene reached $2 million. Despite his success, Rockefeller was not content but his drive to expand his operations was at the mercy of his suppliers, over which he had virtually no control. John D. Rockefeller was concerned about the fluctuating prices in the oil industry. It was a boom-bust industry, and he thought that if he could stabilize the industry, this would not only be good for America, but it would be good for John D. Rockefeller. De Rockefeller, stabilize meant control and the best way to get control was to buy it. He bought his own ships to transport Rockefeller kerosene from Cleveland to the Midwest, tanker cars to transport crude oil to the company's refineries and warehouses in New York. He even purchased forest reserves of white oak timber to ensure the company had an adequate supply of barrels. But there was one more thing left to conquer, and for help, Rockefeller turned to a man who was to become his closest business associate and friend, Henry Flagler. Flagler joined Rockefeller in 1867. He had a kind of an interesting background as well. He had been selling produce and mostly distilling whiskey. And he made quite a bit of money, but unfortunately he also lost all of the money. Uh, one of these gentlemen up and down several times until he joined Rockefeller in 1867. He was sort of the perfect counterpart to Rockefeller. He was energetic and, and outgoing, uh, sort of an extrovert to uh, uh, offset uh, Rockefeller's uh, very introverted kind of personality. And the two of them made an ideal team. Together, Rockefeller and Flagler were determined to protect the oil industry and themselves from the chaos of economic uncertainty. But to do so, they would have to wrestle control away from the most powerful industrial force in America. In 1870s America, the railroads were all powerful. The growth of American industry was dependent on the rapid transportation of goods and supplies. Rockefeller's Standard Oil was no exception. But while other industries cowered before the powerful railroad companies, Henry Flagler called their bluff. As Secretary of Standard Oil, Flagler was assigned to negotiate shipping rates with the railroads. He went after his task with a ruthlessness and aggressiveness the likes of which the railroads had never seen. Flagler was in an excellent position to negotiate since Standard Oil had a stranglehold on the oil industry. By 1871, Standard Oil transported by rail over a million barrels of crude oil and kerosene. The threat of losing standard shipping business was more than the railroads wanted to risk. Flagler could dictate the price. Uh, if he wanted a rebate from the railroad so that he would have a competitive advantage, all he had to do was tell them that he was not going to pay their price, he was going to pay only something less. If they didn't like that, they could go to some other refiner. The problem was, there weren't any other refiners. 
Their relationship with the railroads gave Standard Oil an incredible competitive advantage in the petroleum market. Rockefeller's competitors were faced with a stark choice, sell out to Standard Oil or go bankrupt. There was a pressure brought upon my mind and upon almost all citizens of Cleveland engaged in the oil business that we were virtually killed as refiners. If we did not sell out, we should be crushed. John Alexander, President, Schofield and Company. To Rockefeller, it didn't matter how his competitors or even the public viewed Standard's business practices. When one rival complained to the oil tycoon that he did not wish to sell, Rockefeller replied bluntly, you can compete with Standard. We have all the large refineries now. If you refuse to sell, it will end in your being crushed. By April 1872, Standard Oil had acquired or absorbed 21 other refining firms in the Cleveland area alone. Rockefeller himself, only a decade after entering the oil business, was one of the richest men in the country, with a personal wealth of several million dollars. He was now both admired and feared by businessmen throughout America. It's interesting to try to figure out how much money he made and how much he uh, accumulated. I think the answer is that at the time, not even Rockefeller knew because the money was literally coming in faster than he could count it. I think comparing a Rockefeller to a Bill Gates is probably a good example uh, because Gates' personal wealth now is in excess of 10 or 15 billion dollars, and that's so far beyond what an average American worker makes today. I think very much an average American worker of the 1890s or the turn of the century probably would have seen Rockefeller in the same terms, because his wealth was certainly in the hundreds of millions, perhaps even approaching a billion dollars. So way, way ahead, an average American production worker, a factory worker, at the turn of the century might be making, depending on his skill level or her skill level, might be making five, ten, twelve dollars a week. So five or six hundred dollars a, a year was considered a decent living for an average industrial worker in America, comparing that with a, with a fortune worth hundreds of millions. So the gap is similar, and, and I think Americans saw these so-called robber barons as people in effect, living in a whole other world. I mean, their, their whole standard of living was just, it couldn't even be compared in some ways. The gap was so great. The future growth of Standard Oil seemed limitless. But forces were gathering that would soon threaten the mighty empire and its king. By 1879, after 15 long years of intimidation, force, and strong arm tactics, the Standard Oil Company controlled an incredible 90% of all refinery operations in the United States. But Rockefeller's overwhelming power caused some Americans to fear that the free enterprise system was in danger. Without competition, there was no force that could check what Standard could do to prices if it so chose. It's looked upon as uh, the monopoly, the, the evil trust, and it's looked upon at this point in what it begins to be known as the American Progressive Era as the antithesis of what America should be. Criticism of Rockefeller reached unprecedented levels. His enemies proclaimed that Standard Oil was legally chartered only in Ohio and that under the laws of the time, the company had no right to own refineries or warehouses in other states. Moving quickly to protect himself, Rockefeller came up with a brilliant plan. In 1882, he organized the Standard Oil Trust. The trust is a legal form of business organization. And in the latter part of the 19th century, it was the mechanism by which monopolies were created. What Rockefeller did with all of his oil companies, he, uh, in a sense, folded them into the standard trust that en ended up owning all of the shares of these companies. Rockefeller could control all of these and operate as a monopoly.